You'll change your mind when you grow up. Everyone always told me that whenever I said I didn't want to have kids. You usually hear that kind of thing from your own parents, right? Not me. My folks never once told me anything about having children of my own or changing my mind. On the rare occasion when the topic was brought up and I'd voice my contempt towards little brats running around the house, taking up my free time, they'd go unusually quiet. I honestly didn't think I ever changed my mind. I expected my parents to start bothering me about it when I became an adult, but my mid-twenties had gone by. Then my late twenties. Then the early thirties. I never really gave it much thought and just figured that I had extremely supportive parents. It was until I got married around the age of 34 and decided to break the news to my parents about my wife Julia being pregnant. Is she okay? My mother's smile contorted and she hastily covered her mouth with her hands, while my father simply stared blankly with an expressionless face. My mother ran out of the room as if she was about to vomit. Is she okay? I asked my dad, obviously baffled by the reaction at such big news. Yeah, she'll be fine. Uh, congrats about the, the baby. I mean, that, that's great, great news. He forced a smile. As he reached for his glass of juice on the table, he accidentally knocked it over his hand, visibly trembling. Oh, no, I've gone and done it. Your mom's going to kill me, he chuckled awkwardly. I'll go get something to clean this up. He stood up and practically ran out of the room, leaving Julia and I in utter silence. What was that about? She asked me. I could tell by her face that she felt horrible, especially since she was really good with my mom and this sort of reaction was unexpected from her. Oh, uh, this is big news for them, you know. I thought they'd be happy. They would! I, I mean, they are! I mean, look, I'll, I'll go check up on them, alright? I went upstairs and called out to my parents, but they didn't respond. It wasn't until I was almost at the top of the stairs that I heard two voices, one distinctly sobbing and the other saying something in a hushed tone. As I got closer to the bathroom, it became clear that my mom was crying, while my dad was trying to soothe her quietly, shushing her along the way. Mom? I asked, as I peeked inside the bathroom. My mom sat in the toilet seat, her face buried in her hands, her body spasming up and down from crying. My dad was on his knees, gently stroking her shoulder. When he heard me, he jerked his head towards me, I leaned on the bathtub, standing up with some difficulty. Dad, what's going on? I asked. I'd never seen my mom like this. Did she hate the notion of Julia bearing my children this much? Kevin, I think you better go now. Your mom's not feeling well, my dad said, as he stepped forward, forcefully making me exit to the bathroom. He closed the door behind him, muffling my mother's cries. Dad, what's wrong with mom? Is she okay? Yeah, she's fine. She's just, she's just a little shocked, but she's, she's happy for you too. It doesn't look like it. Trust me, she is. Go home. I'll call you later. Before I could say anything else, he went back inside the bathroom and shut the door in my face. Dumbfounded, I knew there was no point in pushing the situation any further, so, so I told Julia that my mother was feeling sick. She didn't buy it, of course, and got angry, saying that my mom could have reacted differently. She was right, and I myself was angry at my parents for the outburst. But at the same time, I hoped that they wouldn't make me pick sides. We drove home, and it wasn't until a few hours later that my dad sent me a text. We need to talk. Stop by around 3 p.m. tomorrow. Alone. Well, this can't be good, I said to myself, but decided to humor him. I had already made my decision about the approach I planned on taking with him. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. This was my wife, goddammit. I, I wouldn't let him insult her like that, no matter what the reason was. The next day I went back to my parents' place and my dad opened the door. He smiled when he saw me, looking a lot less distressed than yesterday. Come on, Kev, he gestured, and I got in without a word. Is mom here? I asked as I hung my jacket on the coat hanger. No, um, I chose a time when she wasn't home so that we could have some privacy, he said as he sat in the living room. He sat on the sofa, the same one he'd been using for the past 20 years, and I stared at him across the room from the couch, the only thing separating us between the coffee table. So, he pursed his lips, tapping nervously on the sofa armrest. How's Julia? Dad, 
I sternly said. What is this all about? Okay, I thought you and mom liked Julia. Look, if you have a problem with the two of us having a kid, then, then you just have to get used to it because I don't intend to. This is nothing to do with her, Kevin. He interrupted me calmly. I called you here because I want to tell you a story. He scratched his chin, looking nowhere in particular. It looked like he was trying to remember something. He couldn't possibly tell what kind of point his story would have or what importance it held that he had to schedule a private meeting for the two of us, but I decided to save my comments until he said his part. Well, he awkwardly looked at me and then down at the coffee table. It all started a long time ago. He took a sip from his water, his hands trembling again, and I wasn't sure if it was from being nervous or from old age. It took everything within me not to ask him what started. He leaned back in his sofa and looked at me with a reinvigorated gaze before continuing. Your great-grandfather was only 23 years old back then. He um, was already dating his wife-to-be, and they were visiting the town's fair. It was a nice summer day, according to the story he told your grandfather. He was just done winning a prize for your great-grandmother in a shooting game. The two of them walked around looking for interesting places to stop at when they saw a peculiar-looking tent. There was a sign in front that said fortune-telling, and your great-grandmother was more than enthused by the idea of seeing what their future entailed. They entered the tent, which seemed to be ominously dark, despite the daylight that should have glared into the entrance. Inside was a gypsy lady, your typical stereotype, red bandana over the head, Lots of jewelry, big round earrings, you know. And she sat by a small round table, which had a crystal ball in the center. She pleasantly welcomed your great-grandparents and asked them if they were interested in knowing their own future for a mere nickel. Well, uh, your great-grandfather decided to go first, thinking there was nothing to lose. He, he sat by the table. The gypsy lady immediately clasped her hands across the crystal ball, which suddenly seemed to emanate a bright light which illuminated the fortune teller's face, revealing all blemishes underneath it. She spoke vaguely of the futures to come, talking about a wedding between your great-grandparents and potential job opportunities, etc. All in all, she didn't give any mind-blowing insight about his future, and apparently, he didn't take that too well, accusing her of being a scammer. She proclaimed that she, she fairly told what she saw in the crystal ball and put her hand forward, demanding the nickel. Well, your great-grandfather refused, ready to leave the tent. The gypsy lady, she, um... She stared at him in silence, no visible emotion on her face, and suddenly... She calmly and quietly started to chant something in an unfamiliar tongue. She assumed was, uh, was Romanian. He suddenly felt a shiver run down his spine. And the air in the room changed drastically, becoming significantly colder than the summer day should have been. She proceeded to hum a certain melody, even going so far as to remove her bandana, cut a piece of her hair, and blow it towards your great-grandfather. More weirded out than scared, your great-grandfather left the place and tried to have more fun in the remaining time at the fair. Well, less than a year later, they got married, and your great-grandmother gave birth to your grandfather, Jacob. Now, Jacob was a sickly boy of poor physical condition, unable to follow up with his peers. He was diagnosed with a rare disease at the age of six. It was estimated by the doctors that he would not live past 12. The great-grandfather was devastated, of course. By the time Jacob reached the age of eight, he got a younger sister. And as soon as she was born, Jacob miraculously recovered. The doctors couldn't explain it. They were, they were baffled by his case, calling him a literal miracle. He lived a long life. He died peacefully. His sister, however, was not so lucky. He shifted in his seat uncomfortably, grimacing as he did so. Did you take a... Do you want to take a break? I asked him. I knew he had a really bad back from years of labor and couldn't sit for too long. As eager as I was to hear the rest of the story, I also didn't want him to go through a physical pain. No, no, I'm good. I, I have to finish telling you this. It's very important. He cleared his throat looked back at me with concern for, for continuing. As I was saying, your, gram, your grandpa, Jacob, he lived the rest of his life healthily. 
sister's birth coincided with a miraculous recovery. However, she didn't live past the age of 21. Your grandpa had your uncle, Scott, when he was 28. His sister had returned to finally feeling better around that time, but it was too late by then. Her disease had progressed too far, and despite showing signs of recovery, she died less than a year later. Right from your birth, your uncle Scott was sick as his father before him, only suddenly recovering when I was born. I took over the curse for some time while Scott grew up to be healthy. I don't remember this because I was still a toddler, but your grandpa swears there were strange occurrences in the house around that time. He said he'd put me in my cradle, only to find me in suspicious places like the top of the wardrobe, out in the hallway, despite the doors being closed and the knobs too high for me to reach. Sounds like there could have been a logical explanation. There were more strange things happening. For instance, he said once that he approached my bedroom, and as he did, he heard someone in there with me, whispering something that sounded like chanting in an unfamiliar language. Hadn't even hit him until he remembered the story of the gypsy lady that his father had told him about years prior to that. He said I giggled at it. And every time I do it louder, there was a soft shh coming from the room. He knew it wasn't your grandma because she had left to visit her parents, but when he opened the door, he found no one inside and I stood in my cradle, seemingly jerking my gaze away from whatever I was fixated on previously to look back at my dad. He said that he saw my eyes darting around the room, as if looking for something. It was around this time that your grandpa Jacob started to suspect that the gypsy that his father told him about may have been more serious in her curse than he had originally thought. He hired all sorts of priests, black magic experts, voodoo experts, and so on. None of them stayed in the house for too long. They never wanted to talk about what they saw, only saying that they, they can't help him. At this point, my dad stood up, and he went over to one of the drawers behind the sofa. He opened it, and he continued speaking as he rummaged through it. Other things that happened were with photos. He'd often take photos with me, and at first, everything seemed okay, but as he looked closer, things were... Well, there was something wrong with the pictures. He continued rummaging in silence, so I figured it was my time to interject. I said, come on, Dad, all of this superstition... Just a streak of bad luck and the photos, they could have been smudges on them or something. He ignored my remark and continued looking through the drawer with loud shuffling noises. When he finally found what he was looking for, he closed the drawer and turned back around, holding a number of old photos in his hand. They trembled at the edges like leaves in a wind. He sat down and flipped through them. He picked out one of the photos and put it in his lap. Maybe so, he said finally. I'll let you decide for yourself. He leaned forward and neatly placed the other photos on the coffee table. He leaned back in his chair and silently gestured for me to look at them. I did as he asked and observed the pictures closer. What do you see? He asked. The first picture at the front was black and white, of my dad as a baby sitting in a pajama next to a set of toys in what looked like a living room and smiling a toothless grin at the camera. I squinted, looking at the background of the picture, and when I saw nothing, I tried to focus on the obvious. My dad's face and the toys around him. Um, nothing. I shook my head. What about the next one? He asked. I flipped the picture, placing it at the back, and the next picture was of my grandpa, cradling my dad as a baby in his arms in the bedroom. My dad seemed to be sleeping in the picture while his mom looked down at him with a smile. Anything? He impatiently asked. I looked around but found nothing suspicious. No, there was something. Some kind of shadow in the corner of the room, but it could have been anything. Although the shape of the shadow looked almost human, stretched thinly around the corners of the wall and the floor. It's hard to tell due to the lack of color in the photo. But there's something here, but I mean... I mean, that could be anything, really. Look at the next one, my dad said sternly. I flipped and stared at the next picture. It was of my dad as a toddler. He was seated at a table with a big birthday cake in front of him. He looked shriveled and sick, but despite that, he was staring at the camera as photogenically as in the first photo. A big, goofy smile. I immediately focused on the background of the picture instead of the things in the center, and sure enough, I saw... something... 
A tall, thin shadow loomed in the background ominously, maybe two steps behind my dad. I couldn't discern any other prominent features, save for the fact that the shape of it looked undoubtedly humanoid, despite the thin look. I couldn't tell for sure, but it looked like the shadow was facing my dad while he unsuspectingly smiled at the camera. Although I wasn't 100% convinced that this was some paranormal occurrence, it sent a shiver running down my spine. I placed the picture at the back and looked at the next one. It was one of my grandpa my dad when he was around five, sitting by a table drawing something with crayons. My dad was smiling at the camera despite looking sicker and paler than before, and my grandpa curiously pointed at something on his drawing. And clear as day, standing right over their shoulder was the same thin shadow from before. It seemed to be hunched over and holding my dad gently by his shoulder, just enough to see its sharp fingertips overlapping on my dad's clothes, enough for me to be convinced this was no faulty camera. Looking up towards where the shadow's face should have been, I also saw what looked like a pair of eyes. Like two tiny clouds of smoke, devoid of any features that human eyes normally had. I hastily placed the picture at the back and looked at the next one. My dad was in the next picture as well, in his teen years, and he looked just as sick as before, sitting up in his bed. Despite that, a smile was strewn across his face as he looked at the camera. A big portion of the picture was black, taken over by that same shadow from the previous photos. It had its thin arms over my dad's shoulders and was looking directly at the camera this time. I saw its cloudy eyes more clearly now, gray and penetrating with malice, but, but a little lower. There was a thinly curved slit. It looked like the shadow was smiling. I suddenly became aware of how fast my heart was beating, so much that, it, that I could feel it thumping upon my chest. I quickly placed the picture at the back and looked at the only remaining one. I braced myself to see something even more horrifying here, but but that never came. I stared at the photo of my dad, still in his teen years holding a baby. Next to him was Uncle Scott. They both faced the camera with eager smiles, while the baby in my dad's arms slept. I squinted, I darted my eyes around the corner of the picture, and then I... then I saw it. The shadow. All the way in the back, barely visible. Two cloudy dots as eyes, and they... They were unmistakably staring in the direction of the baby. Well, my dad asked finally, staring at me unblinking with wide eyes. What is it? I asked, with a quivering voice. As soon as Scott had his daughter, I got better, he said. His daughter died very early on, though, and there was no more strange occurrences, at least not for a while. We had started to hope that the curse was over, and then... And then you were born. I opened my mouth to say something, but, but I didn't know what to say. I placed the photos awkwardly back on the coffee table and spoke up. I was never sick. My dad stared down at the coffee table, and I could see tears well up in his eyes. You didn't even try to hide it. He said... No, you weren't. But your brother was. I wiped my eyes, trying to speak, but only an inaudible gas left my mouth. I leaned forward and said, Dad, what... What brother? My dad sniffled, his eyes now red, as he handed me the final photo with a trembling hand. I grabbed it, feverishly glancing at it. There were two newborn babies on it in the hospital nursery. They were seemingly sleeping peacefully in cribs side by side. I had to know, my dad said, sobbing. I just had to. As soon as you and your twin brother were delivered, I, I had to take a picture to see if the shadow would be back and my suspicions were confirmed. When I took that picture... I glanced at the photo again, looking towards the corner of the room. There it was. Despite light illuminating the entire room, the shadow stood in the corner, its malicious gaze focused on one of the babies in the cribs. Dad. I looked up at him, tears welling up in my own eyes. Your brother was born twelve minutes after you. You grew up to be healthy, but your brother... Your brother died less than a year later. 
He buried his face in his hands and wept violently for a while, and all I could do was stare at the picture, at, at the insidious shadow that had taken my brother away from me, without me ever getting to know him. My dad regained his composure and finally spoke up again. I tried to stop it. I talked with all sorts of experts, but, but when everything rational failed, I found one gypsy fortune teller to help me. I was desperate. I told her I'd, I'd pay her as much as she wanted as long as she took off the curse. She confirmed that this, this was some sort of black magic, that whatever, whatever that shadow is, it was summoned from another world by the fortune teller that your great-grandfather refused to pay. So she managed to, to break the curse? It's not that simple. Black magic can't be dispelled by anyone but the person who placed the spell. And the gypsy fortune teller that cursed our family has been, has been dead long since. The shadow always seemed to latch onto the youngest one in our family, and the only way it ever leaves them alone is by latching onto a newborn. However, if the family member it latches onto dies, the evil spirit goes dormant for a while. Your Uncle Scott's daughter died. Everything was fine for years, and then your mom and I had twins. And it came back. After you finished off your poor brother, everything went back to normal. It's, it's dormant right now, but once you have a child, it'll come back. And every generation, it gets stronger. He sniffled, wiped his tears, as I continued staring at the picture of myself and my brother in the nursery. So how do we stop it? I asked. He shook his head. You can't. The gypsy woman that I talked to said that this spirit will never leave till the last member of our family dies. That's the only way to banish it back to wherever it came from. He exhaled deeply and was calm again as he continued. Whether you want to have a child is your own choice, but if you do, you have to know that you're putting it in danger. Your uncle Scott had no other children, so you're the last surviving descendant of our family. The spirit will latch onto your child without doubt. I didn't say anything. A moment later, my phone vibrated, and when I looked at it, I saw a message from Julia asking me where I was. Dad, I, uh... I'm going to go now. I have things to take care of, I said. Yeah, I understand. You stood up. I know this is a lot to take in, but I want you to think about everything that I told you today. I know you're not superstitious, but I implore you to think about it. I nodded and I left. I thought about it. The whole time on my drive back home, I mean, could there really be some malevolent spirit haunting our family whose only purpose was to feed off this newborn? It, it sounded ridiculous. Couldn't possibly be true. I dismissed it. Decided to have a relaxing dinner with Julia. I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of the nagging feeling, though, so I, I took... I took up my phone. I told Julia to smile. Hey, stop it, she said smiling at the camera. My flash temporarily blinded her and I apologized. I entered my phone's gallery and I looked at the picture I took. But I didn't focus on Julia. How do I look? She asked. I zoomed in the corner behind her. It may have been my imagination. But behind Julia... In the corner of the room, right next to the curtains, looked like there was a very thin, very tall shadow stretching across the wall, with two tiny, cloudy dots for what looked like eyes, and they were... They were staring directly at her. Thank you. 
Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you so much for listening to the Mr. Creepypasta Storytime Podcast found on Spotify or anywhere else where you guys happen to find podcasts. Or if you didn't find me there, then thank you for watching on YouTube and subscribing to the YouTube channel, Mr. Creepypasta. Or if you haven't found me there, then I have literally no idea how you could have found me. And now for patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, which you can always find in the link in the description, I want to give you all a very big thanks. There's many of you down there in the descriptions um, who I give big thanks to and everybody also at this tier, like Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Asia, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Don Mulemeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Optimistic Avocado, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Polson, Finley, and Sky Harbor. You guys are the MVPs and you guys keep the channel running and I honestly cannot thank you enough for all that you do. That's all for tonight, guys. Sweet dreams. <laughs>